Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Mr. Yunitan. I'm one of the co-chairmen of this project. Um, it's an absolute delight um, to invite you all um, today. Uh, my understanding is that we have got over 600 registrations uh, that itself explain the popularity of this project. This is our third webinar. Uh, today is a very important topic about um, uh, statistics and critically appraise a paper. Now, statistics as such is a broad topic. Um, um, uh, each subsection of that is a lecture on its own. We have tried to condense that into an hour and a bit. And it's my absolute delight to invite uh, Mr. Khalil, who's a mentor to me, who is, uh, um, uh, has got in-depth knowledge of statistics. He teaches um, um, in uh, Royal Holloway. Um, and also, um, he is a well-known orthopedic surgeon. He has produced uh, um, uh, quite a number of critical papers. I'm surprised that he still not, not got a chair. I'm sure that that is on its way. Um, and a second, pa a second paper is presentation of a paper um, by a farm, uh, by Mylan um, pharmacological com uh, com pharmaceutical company, and Zinobia is going to present it. Um, uh, we, are, we are trying to. Um, give you an understanding that when a, ph a pharmaceutical company comes and presents a paper, how do you appraise the paper and how will that affect your patient care? Uh, now, we don't have any, uh, we don't, as an organization, we do not get any financial gains by presenting this paper, but I think uh, this paper is based on diabetes, which is, which um, is, um, uh, is, an, uh, is, is a disease uh, which affects worldwide. Now, um, uh, enjoy the next hour and a half and I'm looking forward to seeing you all uh, for our fourth uh, webinar. Yes. Hello, good morning, folks. We are going to have fun <laughs> with statistics this morning. Ah. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, okay? Uh, I'm not a statistician, so, but I do have to read papers. And therefore, the point of this exercise is to try and bring the language of statistics into English so we can all understand what we are reading and we don't end up totally confused. Uh, my talk will cover uh, bits of research, audit, and the mythical p-value and we will learn something about meta-analysis and how to read forest plots. So, I would like to ask you this question. You know gravity exists. What I want to know is what would you call this question if I ask you, does gravity exist in Edinburgh? Would you think that was a research question or an audit question? And uh, if you answer that, you may even get your certificate. Okay, let's start with audit. Audit is simply kite marking or benchmarking, which means that when this company made their heather honey and they sell it to you, the quality, the product matches the best heather honey they ever made. Okay, similarly, when you go to buy concrete from these folks, they, you are assured that the concrete you're getting is exactly like the best concrete they ever made, okay? Uh, we know about the cycle of audit and then everybody involved uh, who has done any audit will, will, will remember that you identify the problem, you look at, your, uh, at the standards, you uh, collect data about your practice and you compare and then you effect change. And the NHS since the late 20, uh, uh, 19, uh, uh, 2010 has been big in clinical audit. And there are some national organizations to help achieve clinical audit. But essentially audit is retrospective. It is big in public health, uh, public funded health cares because uh, we need to standardize care and you don't end up with postcode lottery, i.e. treatment that is uh, dissimilar. So if, for example, one should have a heart attack in London, the treatment should be exactly the same if you were, say, in Devon. Um, the main thing about audit is that it is local. It is local versus expected 
practice. And one can uh, analyze every aspect of healthcare. As physicians, we, we are interested in, 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 in outcomes, but as policymakers, they're interested in, 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 in something uh, different. So let's take, for example, this graph, which represents a three-year period of eight standardized incidents of prostate cancer uh, in the four different countries that make up the United Kingdom. Now, if you were in Wales, you would wonder why you, were, you had that high a rate compared to Scotland. Now, it may mean that uh, uh, there, there is something wrong in accessing primary care or secondary care uh, for this age group. Uh, maybe the GPs are not sending the patients along, or maybe this is actually real and there is a, a, a higher risk of prostatic cancer in, in Wales. Now let's bring it even more local. This is my hospital. We look after 400,000 uh, population. So by these standards, living in England, we would expect to see 400 patients every, every, every three year cycle. Now, for example, a year we don't see 400, we see 200. Now that should start to alert us that there is a problem. Uh, and therefore we are not meeting one of our key standards, which is to see round about 400 patients. So this is one aspect of audit uh, that can be used to effect healthcare. There is however a big problem with audit. So this is the uh, fracture neck of femur service uh, a, 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 in a hospital. These are patients who presented there with severe pain. And the idea was that the benchmark was 50% of those patients should receive pain management or analgesia within 20 minutes of their arrival. And as you can see, over a whole decade, they never achieved it. So the question is, they kept doing audits, but why did they never achieve this 50% this, uh, 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 mark. Well, the problem with audit is essentially of engagement management. There's usually uh, failure of sufficient information. Uh, there, the evidence is not competent and there is professional skepticism in that the, the benchmarks are, are, are arbitrary. They sometimes happen to be made up in, in, in designed in meetings and therefore there is very low, little local engagement. So let's leave audit and go to this mythical topic, research. Now, if you get your answer from a search engine, then that's not research. Research, as described by our forefathers, was essentially a model of testing a hypothesis. Okay, in short, that's what research is. You form a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis, and then either you accept or you reject the hypothesis. And then there are elements to research. It must be measurable and it must be verifiable, i.e. objective and empirical. The procedures to achieve uh, research are valid and they must be, uh, and there are principles. But most importantly, research leads to more questions. Just like audit, it is a cyclic or a helical process. And we go along answering questions as, as we learn. Uh, so the best example I can give about research that has happened uh, is, the, is the quest for the DNA. So let's start. The first hypothesis was made by Sir Charles Lyell. Essentially, he was a geologist and what he noticed were fossils. But some of these creatures that he'd found did not exist in his day. And this is in the 1800s. Uh, so he thought that some creatures have gone extinct and they did not survive. So he had a hypothesis that of animal survival. And his friend, Charles Darwin, then came up with a theory based on observation when he noticed the adaptation of the Galapagos finches to the local environment. So, so far we've gone through a, a, a hypothesis and a theory. There was experimentation by Mandel on the basic principle of genetics which have been established. Now, none of these folks knew where, where these uh, uh, changes were happening. Um, but these experiments were then reconfirmed and verified by many other people. 
And, and then finally, the link to human disorders was made by an observation by uh, Garrod, uh, uh, based on the uh, urine turning uh, due to uh, uh, alcaptonuria. So this was familial, and he called it chemical individuality. He still didn't know it was genetic. Uh, until uh, Avery experimented with uh, converting harmless bacteria by injecting them with something called the transforming principle. And look, they, they found the element and, and they converted these harmless bugs into lethal ones, okay? They still didn't know what, the, what exactly where this was happening. And this is the 1940s. So we've gone from the late 18, 1800 to mid 1900. And Irvin Shagav was able to identify the composition of DNA. We still didn't know where it existed, what shape it took, but he knew the chemical composition. And what did this mean to him? Well, he couldn't say. And we've gone down the wrong routes as well. So Linus Pauling hypothesized that the, like all other protein molecules, that DNA was probably an alpha helix, a single stranded helix. But well, that changed when Rosalind Franklin was able to photograph a crystal DNA, and she thought it was probably helical. And finally, we had proof of the triple heli uh, double helix structure of DNA. So now look at how research has gone on over 200 years just to find out where uh, DNA exists and what shape it takes and what is it, uh, are the consequences of DNA. So now let's form our research question, okay? So I ask this question as folks are unable to come to London now, are all buses in London red? Okay, that's our research question for this morning. Well, what are we, how are we gonna solve this? We're going to make a hypoth form a hypothesis and our hypothesis is all buses in London are red, okay? Then we are going to go test our hypothesis. And the easiest way to disprove or prove this hypothesis is to look for one non-red bus. Guess what? We found this one non-red bus and therefore we have to reject our hypothesis. Not all buses in London are red. So that was pretty straightforward, wasn't it? Pain, painless. But now we change the question to our most buses in London red. So we now need to understand what the word most means. But again, just imagine if London only had 10 buses, right? So we could either look at all the buses or look for one non-red bus and count the number of non-red buses. But the problem is none, London does not have 10 buses. London has 9,000 buses. So we now have a problem. We can't physically sit and count those 9,000, that would take almost a week. What we can do in a day, however, is to take a sample of all the buses. And then we look for the non-red bus in our sample. Okay, so imagine if there are 9,000 buses, or there are 9,000 buses, and we take 1% sample, which means we, sh uh, we look at 100 buses. We now set a significance level in our sample, which means how many non-red buses do we expect to see in our sample of 100? Is it 1%, i.e. 0.01, 5%, 0 0.05, or 10%? Point one. We could take any example, 50%, but these are the three classic examples that, we, that, that are done in research. So we would take a look at these. What we then have to understand is that do these figures mean that respectively there are 90, 450, or 900 out of the 9,000 uh, buses that are not read in London? Is that what it, this would mean? So. Let's start our research. We set a hypothesis and our hypothesis will be called null hypothesis. Now null hypothesis means there is no relationship between the two items we are searching. I, in this situation, there is no relationship between red color and buses in London. I, most buses in London are not red. That's our hypothesis. 
Okay, this is the method uh, that was started from Aristotelian time, and this is the method of do searching for nulls hypothesis. Right, we now go and look at 100 buses, and these are results. We find 92 red buses and eight non-red buses. Okay, and to prove that we are not colorblind, six of them were green, one yellow, and one orange. Right, we could just report this fact, couldn't we? That 92% of London buses are red. Okay, but is this true? Remember, this was just a sample, a sample of 100 out of 9,000 buses. And sometimes people just report this, but this isn't quite scientific and you understand that this is not a valid statement. So what we what do we do next? We analyze our sample, okay? Uh, and we ring up our statistical mate and he says, right, you have a hundred buses. This is a discrete numerical data. Bus can only be one, two, three, four. So it's discrete and it's numbers. And your other variable is nominal variable, i.e. a bus color, okay? Uh, and therefore, what you need to do is use one of these tests, the one portion chi-squared uh, goodness of it, essentially a chi-squared test, okay? And so you say, all right, thank you very much. I shall go and do this. So now we set our sample at 5%, which means that we expect to see five non-red buses in our sample of 100. And here we go, we set our significance level. We expect to see 95 red buses, uh, five non-red buses, and this is our observation. And guess what? When we press enter, we get this result. The result is not significant. And we go, oh dearie me, we are not going to get published, are we? This is not good. But what does that p-value mean to us? What is this result telling us? Well, what this is telling us is that in our test or in our model, we expected to see five non-red buses. Guess what? We found eight. So what, what p-value is telling us is that your result or our result is not surprising. This is what we were expecting, okay? So p-value is probability. P stands for probability. So what we're saying is that in our distribution, the probability of finding uh, 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 the result was what we were expecting, i.e. within the standard deviation. So that if null hypothesis is true, this is what we were expecting. And guess what? That's what we found. Uh, so here, here is the distribution, and here is our data. And therefore, this is within what we were expecting in our, uh, our, our, our setup. And therefore, our result is not surprising. Our p-value is not significant. The word, you could use the word significant for surprising. And therefore, we fail to reject null hypothesis. We never accept null hypothesis, okay? We either reject null hypothesis or we fail to reject null hypothesis. So the reason why we are failing to reject null hypothesis in this setup is that the probability of getting five or fewer non-red buses in our sample of 100 with this test, if the null hypothesis is true, is about 18%, 17%. So that's why we are failing to reject null hypothesis. Now, if you do that, then does that mean that most buses in London are not red? Are we trying to say that more than 450 out of 9,000 buses are not red? Is this what that test means? Hmm, okay. We ring our statistician friend again and say, it's, gosh, we are desperate, please help. So he says, okay, all right, here we go. We can do something else. What we're going to now do is we keep your data the same, but we're going to change our significance level. Last time we were expecting 5%, okay? That value. But what we're going to do is change our significance to 1%, okay? 0 0.01. So now we expect to see one non-red bus in our sample of 100. And when we do the test, guess what? 
the result is significant. Wow, happiness. So what does this mean then? What it means is when we set the probability of finding only one non-red bus in our sample and suddenly eight come along, our result is now surprising. Our p-value uh, probability is outside the standard deviation. It is not what we were expecting. So what, what the p-value is telling us is that the probability of getting one or fewer non-red buses out of a total of 100, if the null hypothesis is true, is less than 1%, i.e. our result is significant. So what do we do now? Now we would reject null hypothesis because our data is suggest that the finding is extreme. And therefore, what are you going to say is, most buses in London are red. But does that mean that 90 out of 9,000 buses, only 90 out of 9,000 buses are red, are not red? Is that what this data suggests? So the question comes to what is our understanding of p-value, okay? Now the, the term p-value was coined by this gentleman, Sir Ronald Fisher. He worked in Hertfordshire. He was hired by the farm, uh, by um, uh, the Rothmead Experimental Station, which experimented on farms, to do analysis on, 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 on plants. And he came up with the analysis of variance, ANOVA that we use in 1920s. He also corrected uh, some of his colleagues at the same time and came up with his own distribution. But his biggest significance to us was setting up something called p-value and analysis of analyses. This is meta-analysis. So look at when meta-analysis was set up and by whom. Anyway, what Fisher introduced was the significance levels, that when we use a model of testing, we can examine the discrepancy between our model of assumption and our observed data. And we either expect to see the result or our result or what we have observed is weird, is way out and is not what we expected. And that makes it significant. And Fisher actually came up with 2%. Uh, if if p-value was between 10 and 90%, there was no reason to suspect the hypothesis. And if it was less than 2%, it suggested that the hypothesis fails to account for the whole fact in that setup. So look, how did we end up with 5%? Okay, uh, so Fisher came up with null hypothesis and he de described null hypothesis as never proven. So you never prove positive null hypothesis, but you disprove null hypothesis through experimentation, okay? And his experiment was this. Muriel Bristol claimed that she could tell whether tea or milk was first, first added to a cup of tea, okay? And that, she met him at, at a tea party and she claimed this. And Fisher was intrigued and he, went off to consider how to test this claim. So he thought about one cup, which gave you 50-50, or two cups, which gave you a varying figure of, of, of guesswork. But he came up with his experiment, which he published in 1935, called the Design of Experiments. And he came up with the idea of using eight randomly ordered cups of tea. Four had tea first, and then milk, and four milk, then tea. And she was asked to select four cups prepared by one method. And he, he set up his null hypothesis that she couldn't do this and this was all purely chance. He then went to analyze uh, the, each uh, option using hypergeometric distribution of probabilities. So if she was going to get all correct, what was the probability of that? If she was going to get three correct, two correct, one, one correct or none correct? And he came up with what essentially looks like a normal distribution curve, okay? So he calculated the probability of each uh, uh, um, possibility uh, of the four cups, okay? And this was it. There were 70 possible combinations. 
and he calculated the probability of each one of them. And in order to get four right, the chances were less than 5%. And anything above five had a probability only three out of four. So look at where 5% came from, from the lady T tasting p-value. So this was the experiment for this hypothesis, for this claim, for this ex model setup. And somehow it's managed to stick. If you go to uh, uh, Wikipedia to look for the definition of p-value, this is what you get, which frankly, even I can't make head or tail of. So I go to the, to the most clever man I know to make sense of what p-value is or uh, p-values and this is it. P-value starts with if null hypothesis is true, what is the probability of observing what we have observed? Or if null hypothesis is true, how rare are my results? Essentially, p-value tells us or the probability of result in the hypothesis, if the hypothesis is true. It certainly does not tell us about the population. It only tests a model. It, and it relates to the sample or the observation to it, the hypothesis of the test. Okay, the threshold p-value of 5% is purely arbitrary. Okay, it was designed for that lady t-testing experiment. The Higgs boson was proven with five sigma. So in particle physics, this is the p-value that is used. Okay, so p, the threshold of p-value is decided by whoever is using it. It has to be put in context. Now, you guys know that in most university exams, you have a pass mark of 40%, okay? Medical school pass mark is 50%. And in certain courses where they don't use a pass mark, but you get a stratified pass, depending on how many pay students have taken, if one gets a result of 46%, what do you do? You go and look at the course you have done. You put the result in context. So p-value should be considered in the context of the test model. Okay. Now, the problem is there is a lot of misunderstanding about p-value. And the Statistical Society came up in 2016 with these six instructions or help or guidelines. We won't go into the details of all of them, but we will take three. The first important thing is that p-value does not tell us the probability that null hypothesis is true. Okay, that's not what it does. All it does is it indicates a degree of compatibility between the data and a particular hypothesis. Okay, so again, it's observation and hypothesis, the relationship of. P-value does not tell us probability that the observed effects were produced by chance, okay? P-value is actually computed under the assumption that a null hypothesis is true, okay? That's what we start off with. We start off with a null hypothesis and the P-value says this, this is true. And now we want to prove by our observation what is the rarity of what we have observed. Okay, what is the percentage of rarity or, or, or weirdness of our data in relation to the hypothesis we set? Okay, and remember that by p-value itself is not a, uh, enough to provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or hypothesis. Statistical significance does not equal clinical significance. Okay, there are several ways of, 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 of improving, uh, of not just using p-value, okay? So the other things that have been suggested, use confidence intervals, which give you some idea of where the doubt is in any given data, okay? One 
pre-registers your, your project so that you don't do what we did, which is to manipulate uh, uh, the statistical analysis. So you set out your experiment with a stated hypothesis and a p-value that you're going to consider. Uh, but once you get your data, you don't go around changing the uh, statistical analysis. You can suddenly do bootstrapping, which is resample the data numerous times to increase uh, possibilities. Uh, we can do Bayesian analysis and Bayesian factor, uh, which, which tells us about the probability of the hypothesis and the best explanation. But none of these methods are entirely foolproof. And therefore, p-value is going to stay with us. The problem with p-value is that there is nothing wrong with p-value. It's how we interpret p-value. So I'll give you a couple of examples, okay? Let us take one of the best users of p-value. So here is a publication that is quite relevant. This was published in our journal, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in July. And this was the mortality rate of patients who had hip fracture during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So it's pretty relevant. Okay. And the conclusion by the authors was that there is a higher mortality rate in patients with hip fracture associated with a positive test for COVID. So this scare would scare everybody, particularly surgeons and patients treating these patients. Now this journal for this paper stopped using p-values. So now we look at their data. They had 136 patients uh, with hip fractures, of which 124 underwent surgical treatment. So not every patient had surgery. Okay. Of the 136 patients entered, only 62, less than half, were tested for COVID. Okay. Of these 62, less than half, I only 23 were positive for COVID. So in 136 patients, only 23 were positive for COVID. Unfortunately, seven of the 23 died. But at the same time, four of the 39 uh, te who tested negative also died. And two of the 74 who were not tested died. But look at, the, their, look at their conclusion. There is a higher mortality rate in patients with hip fracture associated with positive COVID test. Now you look at that data and you say, really? Seven of 23, four of 39, two of 74? Where did they come up with this? Well, they used a single data sheet. They used seven out of 23, giving a mortality rate of three th over 30% for patients positive test who had surgery. You think, is that reasonable or is that alarmist, right? Is this result surprising? Because figures and percentages always look high, don't they? So what should we do? Well, we could test this, these figures and we test it. Uh, with hypothesis testing. So we set up a hypothesis, a null hypothesis, that this data is not surprising. Okay. Okay. Then we go ahead and test our null hypothesis. Okay. And we use 1% significant level. Okay. 0 0.01. Not 5%, not 10%. We're going to use 1% significant level to in this model to test these, this hypothesis. So, what do we have? We have uh, 23 positive patients. Okay, here we go. Seven who died, 16 alive. We have 39 uh, negative patients, four who died and 35 alive. And we're using a Fisher's T test at 0 .0, uh, at 1%, 0 0.01, okay? And look at what we get. We get a non-significant result, okay? which means that the, the, these results with this hypothesis should not be surprising. Okay, the probability of getting one death or fewer out of 100, if this null hypothesis was true, is about 8%. So it is not extreme 
data. So is it still fair to make this conclusion that there is a higher mortality rate in patients with a hip fracture and an associated positive test, primarily based on percentages? Now let's give you another example of where p-value is used correctly. This is data from our unit. Okay, we also treated hip fractures during COVID time, and we have here 94. But we also have patients who were treated this year outside the COVID period, 82. And we compared this 94 to a similar period last year, 106. We looked at their mean age, we looked at the whether we are treating the same group of patients with their ASA grade, and then we looked at their mortality, 9%, 10%, and last year it was only 4%. So again, it would look that percentages wise, we have a higher percentage. But when we did their p-value analysis, I, we compared the COVID to 2020 data, it was not significant. The mortality rate was not significant. We again compared the COVID period mortality to last year's mortality. And again, uh, it was not significant. So we concluded, but look at, read this conclusion. It says, from our data, mortality rate in patients undergoing a neck or femur fracture surgery, not surgery, was not significantly different from a similar cohort earlier in the year and a similar period last year. So our conclusion is exactly what our p-value has told us, that we are, all we can talk about is the mortality rate of patients go undergoing surgery during COVID, early in the year and past year. We cannot make any other statement about fracture surgery and COVID or non-COVID mortality rate. So this is the correct way of interpreting p-value. You can only talk about the model you have tested. And if we do that, we cannot make errors of judgment in p-value and there's no confusion. So now let's move on to forest plot, okay? And note how forest is with a small f because it is not the, it's not a name. Here's the history. The first recorded analysis from multiple data was done by Carl Pearson in 1904. The, uh, the, a vaccine for, for against typhoid was being marketed and was being sold to the British Army. Uh, and the British Army said, right, before we buy it, let us find out whether it works. And they tested this in six of their various uh, stations where the British Army was stationed. And when Carl Pearson analyzed the data, he came up with that the effect is too small to recommend the vaccine, okay? So the British Army did not buy the typhoid vaccine based on this analysis. So this was the first analysis of putting data from multiple sources, i.e. a meta-analysis. But the word meta-analysis was coined by Glass. He was actually an educationalist in 1970s, in 1976, okay? And, this, and there is a slight difference between systematic reviews and meta-analysis. In systematic review, we do a critical appraisal, whereas in a meta-analysis, we look at the same question and we generate a quantitative estimate of the phenomena, okay? The development, and there are some big names. This is Arnie Cochran, who is very famous. And they did a meta-analysis in the 1970s on the role of aspirin in mortality of uh, heart attacks. And uh, their recommendation at that, at that time was that further trials were required to establish if this effect was real. So that's, that's, uh, uh, that's very humble. But Pato, Robin Pato was the first one to design and analyze a random control trial in such a way that was, it was intended to enable physicians without statistical training to understand it. And, and he suggested when such analyses are presented that doctors should be able to appreciate them more critically, okay? And that they can analyze the data themselves. So he's put in a method of using meta-analysis so that we can all understand it. I make the language of, of meta-analysis familiar. So 
uh, the meta-analysis process has evolved, has gone under evolution, and this is the current method, either the Cochrane or the Prisma method. Okay, uh, and this starts by asking a question, identifying the data, selecting, making an analysis, analysis, evaluating for bias, and then presenting the data. So this is how the Prisma method uh, uh, uses meta-analysis. Okay, and uh, there are lots of software and you can log on and you will see how the software works. Okay, but the most important thing is how you frame a question and the PICO model is used. So suppose we wish to study the effectiveness of mindfulness meditation on anxiety. How are we going to frame this question? Well, we're going to have an anxiety as our outcome. We're not interested in mindfulness for depression. We are only in interested in anxiety. And we are only interested in mindful meditation. We're not interested in any other health outcome. Okay, so PICO states that we're going to use adults. Okay, uh, there is no barring in terms of sex or nationality. Uh, intervention is mindfulness meditation. We're going to compare it to all methods known, such as placebo, no treatment, anxiolytics, traditional approaches, drugs, cognitive behavioral therapy. And our outcome measure is either an anxiety symptom score or a generalized anxiety score. Okay, so when we use PICO for, in this setup, we end up with this question. Among adults, compared with all other approaches, what is the effectiveness of mindful meditation for the relief of anxiety. And that's how we frame a meta-analysis question using PICO. But we then go and do a search uh, and we can use all these search engines uh, that have data, but we mustn't forget the unpublished data. Now, unpublished data is also registered in clinical registries and in uh, libraries, or you can also ask your mate who's doing un uh, uh, trials, uh, uh, as long as you acknowledge unpublished data, okay? And then we do selection based on uh, either a quality criteria or using specific studies, including unpublished studies. We then extract from them either raw data or a summarized data. The raw data needs then to be co converted into a summarized form. Uh, so it's much easier to use summarized data and aggregate data, okay? Now the method of analyzing meta-analysis is either something called fixed model assumption or random effect model. Okay, there's a third model that is coming in, but essentially at the moment, these are the two classical methods. What do they mean? Well, the fixed effect model, here we have three different studies. What it says is that the effect size uh, is due to a common mean and variation is essentially due to sampling. Okay, so it's one population. Say, for example, we are looking at a particular drug for hypertension. We are going to assume that everybody is exactly the same and that the only difference to the blood pressure is due to the drug. Okay, so that is the fixed common, uh, fixed effect or common effect model. All right. And what it doesn't account for is variation in the population. So therefore, we know that the blood pressure can be affected by other things other than just uh, our pill. And therefore we have to become, uh, allow for that. And that, that is, allows the, that's called the random effect model. When uh, studies uh, uh, quantify different underlying means, okay? It relaxes the assumption that all studies are based on the same population. But as soon as we do this, we now need to quantify between study variants, okay? We have to quantify uh, the variation between our studies. In our fixed model effect, we did not have to quantify the variation. We had, uh, we assumed everybody were, in all the studies, everybody is exactly the same. In the multi-level assumption, we have variation even in each study. 
So we now have to allow for not just between study variation, but as well as in study variation. So this gets even more challenging. Right, once we have decided what model we are going to use, we now have essentially two steps for our meta-analysis. One is to come up to what we describe as the effect size. What are we measuring? And then we specify its confidence interval, i.e. How, um, how sure are we about this effect for each individual study. Uh, the aggregate, uh, the effect size can be a relative risk or the odds ratio. Okay, so what is odds ratio? Well, it's a very simple way. Imagine you have a deck of cards, okay? And I ask you, what is the probability of drawing a spade? Well, it's very simple. We have uh, 52 cards in a deck and there are 13 spades. Let's leave the jokers out. So the probability of drawing a spade is 25% or one in four, okay? But what are the odds? So in the same setup, the odds of drawing a spade, which is 0.25, are the odds of drawing a spade versus the odds of not drawing a spade. So 0.25 over 0.75, okay? So the odds of drawing a spade are one to three. So look, the probability is one to four, but the odds are one to three. So odds can sometimes change with depending on number, um, but that's what the odds are, okay? And these are the four things that we aggregate models, uh, uh, aggregate summary effects are used uh, in meta-analysis. So let's go through them. Let us do look at a randomized control trial where we have given drug A against placebo, okay? We gave 40 patients drug A, and 36 placebo. And we are interested in complication C. Eight are patients who took drug A got complication C. Only three who took placebo got complication C. So when we do the absolute risk, we see eight patients took a, taking drug A got complication uh, out of 40. So eight out of 40 is 20% uh, risk. Whereas three out of 36, with placebo. So we will say 20% of patients will get complication C with drug A against 8% with placebo. Okay, so that is the absolute risk of developing complication. But what is the attributable risk? Now, we had 8.3% patients who didn't take drug A also got the complication. So in order to attribute the risk to drug C, uh, to drug A, we now subtract that. So 20% minus 8.3% gives us 11.7%. This is the attributable risk of developing a complication, i.e. a risk difference, okay? What is the relative risk? Well, the relative risk is the ratio of a, a absolute risk. Okay, so unlike attributable risk, which was minus, relative risk is a ratio of, of, the, of the absolute risk. So it's 20 over 8.3, which gives us 2.4. So uh, what we're saying here is that drug A relative to uh, placebo has a 2.4 in associated increased risk of complication C, or drug A relative to plus B, to placebo doubles the risk of complication. So that's how we state a relative risk. What are the odds ratio? Well, we then have to calculate the odds of developing uh, complication C uh, with drug A, which means eight over 32, i.e. eight who got versus 32 who didn't get, okay? Uh, versus the same odds of complication with, uh, with placebo, three, who got versus 33 who didn't get. There you go. So eight over 32 divided by three over 32 gives us 2.75. So the odds of developing complication C with drug A relative to placebo are 2.75. Look, look at how these numbers and percentages change with the same data. Absolute risk will always be lower, uh, will be higher, 
a treatable risk will be lower, the risk ratio will be slightly low, odds ratio will be high, okay? And these odds ratio will always be odds to one, okay? We're comparing to one. So this is, this is important to understand because our meta-analysis is based on these uh, surrogate figures, okay? Or composite figures. So the relative risk or risk ratio and the odds ratio are always related to one. A risk ratio of three means that the, uh, the outcome is increased threefold. A risk ratio of 0.5 means the risk is cut in half. Odds ratio of greater than one increase means there is a greater exposure, association between exposure and outcome. And OR of one means that there is no association between exposure and outcome. Okay. Why is this confusing? Well, here is a drug that was marketed for lowering cholesterol. Okay, it was published in the New England Journal, but in the newspapers, it was presented slightly differently because people got confused at what data they were looking at. It was, it was sold as reducing the risk of heart attack by 50% versus 48%. But look at what the drug was given in. The drug was given to patients in healthy individuals. Okay, so cholesterol leveling versus placebo. Now, the relative risk versus health risk of a heart attack in patients with receiving placebo was actually 0.37. <laughs> so the risk reduction was much less than 50%, right? So one just needs to be very careful about what data is being presented and how it's being presented and what is being marketed, okay? So there's no, when you, when you add the relative risk of, of, of uh, reduce the relative risk, then you see that rosuvastatin cannot reduce the risk of heart attack or stroke by 50% in healthy individuals. Now, we did, we arrived at the step one, which was to arrive at a surrogate point. What we now need to do for each uh, study, we now need to weigh that end result in the study. And essentially, studies that give us more information carry more weight. And we use an inverse variation, okay? And it's closely related to how many patients or what the sample size is. So in a fixed model inverse, a model assumption where we assume all the patients are ex all patients are across all the studies the same. Uh, we like studies with big samples, okay, and we use simple inverse variance. In the random effect assumption, we have to quantify the variation, okay, and it's unique to each study. And then we have to quantify the between study variance. We don't have to quantify the, that variation in a fixed assumption model because we assume that all the patients in across all the studies are the same. And all we are going to use is inverse uh, variation. Okay. And then we give the precision of our summary estimate by using confidence interval or, and testing it uh, with a null hypothesis. So we get a p-value of our summary estimate as well. We assume that there is no difference in the p-value uh, and, and we quantify that. And then we combine the weights, inverse variation, and we present it. So in this study of using odds ratio, uh, the, 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 uh, this study, uh, was 30%, almost 30% of the total, uh, was weighted at 30% and hence a big fat box. Uh, this study was only 0.25% and look at its, uh, its weight, okay? This arrow indicates that this is going to continue outside the study in the scale. Okay, but as I said, we, when we look at the uh, second model, uh, which is allowing for variation in studies, we now need to quantify this factor, this heterogeneity or variability among studies, uh, which produces inconsistency in effect size. This can arise due to clinical difference in participants, our methodological differences in design and our risk of bias, and in a statistical analysis. 
And this is usually given summarized in studies using either the Cochrane's chi-square test or the I2 index, I-squared index. Okay? This gives a, a percentage estimate of, 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 of variability across the, across the study. So these two measures assess heterogeneity among studies and summarize it. There are other ways of assessing heterogeneity. You can do subgroup analyses, i.e. compare the effect size in subgroups, or you do a meta-regression analysis, which is to uh, study the influence of variables on effect size. If we get a lot of heterogeneity, the authors can simply not do a meta-analysis. Okay, you can, uh, you, uh, you don't have to do, you can do, uh, 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 or one can ignore the heterogeneity. We can certainly change what we are measuring, i.e. Uh, effect measure, or we can exclude studies because they are making, uh, say, say a single study had out, uh, a whole bunch of outliers, so we can exclude that study if it is producing uh, significant heterogeneity, but the authors have to acknowledge that. So here are two studies that have looked at methods of treating knee arthritis. Uh, this study has used uh, electroacupuncture, and this study has used transcutaneous electrical stimulation. In this study, three papers were, were looked at in this meta-analysis, and look at their heterogeneity between the studies, I2 of 0%. So essentially, they're looking, the studies were almost the same or the population were almost the same. Whereas this study used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, studies, this randomized control trial, but look at their heterogeneity, almost 50%. So even though they had uh, 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 show a significant effect, this study has pretty high heterogeneity. And this is how heterogeneity is usually assessed. If it is less than 25%, it is low, i.e. the studies resemble each other. If it is around 50%, there is moderate heterogeneity, i.e. there are lots of variations between the studies. And therefore, your effect size, in need, you need to be careful about how you assess that effect size. And if it's going up to 75%, there is a whole bunch of heterogeneity between the data. And be careful. We then put the summary estimate in our forest plot. So here we've used, as you can see, uh, they've used uh, odds ratio, relative risk, and therefore the line of no effect will go through one. So this is a relative statistic. This meta-analysis is based on absolute uh, statistic, i.e. absolute risk reduction, as we have discussed, or a standardized mean difference. So it goes through zero, okay? So that's why some meta-analysis go through one, some go through zero. It's basically what is the summary effect? Is it a relative statistic or is it an absolute statistic? Relative means relative to one. Right. Then in a meta-analysis, we have to assess and quantify bias, okay? And this is usually done or can be done on a funnel plot. So a funnel plot has an effect estimate on the horizontal axis and the precision or the study size on the uh, vertical axis. So as a data, uh, as a study has large uh, esti uh, uh, number uh, study size, the effect size can be more precise. So they tend to sit higher up, okay? Uh, a study that has uh, small uh, um, uh, uh, study size, their effect size will not be as precise. So they tend to sit down here. But overall, you should have enough studies on either side of your odds ratio or your uh, line of no effect. And these represent confidence interval. This data, on the other hand, this study, this uh, Beck's funnel plot looks asymmetrical. There are not enough studies on this side. And the commonest cause is a publication bias. Studies, small studies showing no result tend not to get published. And therefore, that's why they're missing on this, okay? But, 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 but asymmetry in a funnel plot is not entirely due to 
publication bias. There can be many other causes of bias and Egger has quoted these and you can actually use a Egger's figure. So these, you can have location biases, you can have true heterogeneity, you can have differing sizes due to study size, you can have data irregularities, poor methods of studying small disease, inadequate analysis, even fraud and choice of effect measure. And I'll give you one other, so here is a, a, a asymmetrical uh, plot and this is due to poor irregularity, uh, data irregularity. And this is due to large bunch of uh, small studies that, are, that have very high, uh, uh, um, show a very high effect. Uh, and that is the problem with small studies showing negative results. If you have a whole bunch of them, they will change the odds ratio and produce an asymmetrical funnel plot. So this is asymmetry funnel plot due to poor design of small studies, okay? Studies can also be quoted uh, in color charts uh, and you decide how you're going to assess them and then you assess, grade them in low risk, uh, moderate risk or high risk uh, depending on the, your criteria and these need to be published in a meta-analysis. So this is again trying to show the assessment of variation. You can come up with a score or just use color charts. Okay, but funnel plots have other uses as well. Okay, uh, like our, our, our NGR data that you can, you can also project the outcome of say, for example, uh, drugs uh, omissions given in, in, in the different wards in this hospital. So th this is the 95% confidence interval. That is the mean data uh, and here are all your uh, wards in that hospital. This ward uh, is, is performing very well. This is an outlier with a very high number of patients who are not receiving their medications on time. So this gives us a funnel plot can be used to present other data, not just in meta-analysis. Here's one method of meta of bias that we have learned about. This is a, a case control study. This was presented in the UK by patients, the same patients being looked at at different times in the trial. So uh, uh, this drug uh, was associated with a 45% reduction in the incidence of lung cancer. And it was published with that uh, risk ratio. However, the problem was time, window, and length of follow-up between cases and controls. And when that was corrected, that was the rate ratio, risk ratio, okay? So there are actually no benefit of statins. But just because we looked at, at the study population at different times, it, it appeared to give this risk ratio. So the magnitude of bias was actually proportional to the ratio of unequal time uh, window lengths of follow-up. So even time window can produce bias. Okay, so now we've learned how meta-analyses are done. What we're going to do now is look at a published meta-analysis. So here is, uh, is an association of peripheral interleukin-6 with global cognitive decline. I told you I was an orthopedic surgeon, so I have to read these words. But essentially, we're looking at inflammatory markers with cognitive decline in non-dementia patients in adults, okay? A meta analysis of prospective studies. And here is that meta analysis published. So let's analyze this. Let's look at this. On this side, we have each individual study with a lead author, which can then either be arranged uh, uh, chronologically or alphabetically. In this study, the, it's been presented chronologically. Either method is perfect, is, is, it's okay. In the middle is the effect estimate information, okay? They have used odds ratio as the effect estimate of each study, and they have put the all, uh, 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 and its precision using standard, um, uh, estimate, uh, uh, deviation estimate and confidence interval. Okay, the standard error and confidence interval of the effect estimate 
or the odds ratio in each study. Okay, and that then allows them to weigh each study and they have included the weight of each study. So the odds ratio, the confidence interval and the weight of their effect. Right. And then the forest plot. The forest is because it looks like trees with leaves and hence the word forest. It's of to algorithmic scale. IV means that we have used inverse variation for each study and the type of analysis, it's a random uh, model analysis. Okay, so they have, they have, they now have to analyze the variation among each studies. The OR, because it's a, a, it's an odds ratio, it's going through one. So on this side will be higher odds, on this side will be lower odds. The whiskers represent the confidence in, interval of each study. Okay, and it's related to the size of the study. So this study, for example, the confidence interval carries on outside the scale and hence it's got an arrow mark. This study is much smaller, so hence the confidence interval is, is narrow. Okay, the squares represent the weights of each study in this, in this meta-analysis. And the summary measure is the diamond. The center is the effect size, and the width of the diamond is the confidence interval of the effects uh, of, the, of the summary measure of the diamond, okay? But remember that, that this was a uh, random uh, model. So we now have to look for bias or heterogeneity between the study, the, the, the variation among the studies. And this has also been analyzed and they're given the I squared here at 14%. And they've also looked at its, uh, they've done a, a, a nulls hypothesis testing. And so therefore they've given us a P value as well of the overall effect. I, they've done a P value analysis of the summary effect and, and, and here it is. Okay, so that's, uh, they've also done subgroup analysis, which they published, and they've done a publication bias. So therefore, this all looks pretty kosher, and you can then start to read what they have said. Okay, but I'll give you another meta-analysis. So this is the indications and effects of passive hydrotherapy or water shiatsu, a systematic review and meta-analysis published this year. Okay, and, and these, the authors have used non-randomized control trials and some randomized control trials to come up with an effect size. So now let us look at this meta-analysis in detail. So here the authors have presented the authors of the individual studies and the meta-analysis in alphabetical order. Okay, uh, the effect they're using is pain on a visual analog score. They've uh, they weighted it and pooled the visual analog score and, uh, or the effect size using the hedges G, which is pretty standard. And they've also given its precision of the effect size in each study with its confidence interval and p-value. And they've weighted each study. So we can see the hedges score, its standard error, the p-value, and its uh, uh, confidence interval. Okay. And then we see the forest plot. In this, the forest plot goes through zero because they are using uh, a standard deviation, okay? They're not using an aggregate data. They're using an absolute data. So uh, it goes through zero. The whiskers of each study with its weight. And then they've given us a summary effect. Remember the diamonds come from other randomized control trials, but this is the summary effect of this particular meta-analysis. And as you can see, it some favors uh, the, the, what they were looking for, okay? Note, there are no tests for heterogeneity because they used a fixed assumption model. And because they used a fixed uh, assumption model, they assumed that all patients entered in the study were exactly the same, and therefore the effect they were measuring was due to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, 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 what they or the, or, or the, 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 but they had given an analysis of their makeup of all the studies and they had graded them, okay? So they had done a qualitative analysis of, of the studies. But what's the problem with this study? 
Well, they're measuring pain as their outcome, okay? And the improvement in pain on a visual analog score. But what does that mean? That my pain score reduced from uh, 50 to 30. What does that mean? Well, when we use these quality of life instruments, such as PROMS and VAS, we have two ways of presenting them in, our, in, 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 in those figures. We can either use normal statistics, i.e. a mid score, 0.5 uh, of standard deviation, so it's distribution based, or we can use it, we can anchor that figure, that number, and relate it to an external criteria, something that the patient understands. So we can, we have a VAS score of ranging from zero to 100, okay? And the patient, we say that a, a VAS score of 60 is this, but a VAS score of 30 means that the, the, the patient says that that is little improved. And this difference in the VAS score is our minimal importance difference. So this is what we are interested in. Okay, if the VAS score remains here, it, the patient has not appreciated uh, an improvement in their pain, okay? And so therefore this difference or this score is what the patient understands as a little improved. Hence, this is an anchor based uh, uh, improvement in quality of life instrument, okay? So here is a study that produced a, a, a difference of six in the VAS score, okay, with pretty significant figures. However, if this study set out to show a mid of 13, okay, so 13, a fall of 13 was what patient perceived as a little improvement. So even though six was statistically significant, it didn't achieve 13. And therefore, as far as the patient is concerned, they have not achieved a little improvement in terms of pain, okay? So unless you anchor the quality of life measures in, uh, into something that the patient understands, this significant improvement in reduction of, of these numbers is meaningless. So why do studies not include the mid? Well, the studies in themselves may have mids missing. Patient, uh, people are aware of anchoring their scores into language that patients understand. But, but the worry is that the studies may, studies that are statistically significant may suddenly become not patient important if mid scores are, are, are used. And therefore the data or the study starts to look less convincing. That is our worry which, uh, of why patient or studies do not include uh, the mid score. So, in summary, meta analyses are retrospective. Okay, the data is already published. The studies are published, the data is out there. Well, who owns the data? Well, we take ownership of the data. And once we do that, the trial design becomes key. Okay, and remember, meta analyses continue to evolve. It, they allow us to combine studies. They uh, give us a common outcome metric, which we can measure, and we can also be precise of, uh, of, the, of this measurement, okay? We can allow uh, to, uh, to, uh, to analyze the variation between studies, i.e. their heterogeneity. But for me, the key questions in meta-analysis are these. Look at who is asking the question, okay? And then, is that answer relevant to me, to my practice? And will that change my practice? And if it is, why on earth didn't I ask that question and do the study, okay? And remember I asked you that before we started? And hopefully when you provide the answer, we may even provide you with a certificate. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all and good morning. And that was an excellent presentation from Dr. Khalil. I certainly learned a lot. Um, so my name is Zenobia Kassam and I'm a business manager for Mylan. 
So I've been invited here today to talk to you about the link between pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, which I will now refer to as PEI, and the link between PEI and diabetes. So before I go any further, I'd just like you to keep the three T's in mind, and I'll tell you what they are during my presentation. So pancreatic atrophy, uh, fibrosis, and uh, loss of acinar cell leads to uh, a reduction in the exocrine in, um, secretion of digestive enzymes, which leads to PEI in all type of diabetes patient. And PEI occurs when the pancreas does not produce enough digestive enzymes or when insufficient amount of enzymes are secreted into the duodenum. And this results in malabsorption and malnutrition. So PEI may be particularly overlooked in patients with diabetes as its main clinical features are attributed to other causes. For example, um, medicines like metformin or GLP-1 agonist, which are more common in diabetes. So I'll talk to you briefly about the prevalence, symptoms, and consequences of PEI, and then we'll talk about a clinical paper that was published by Professor Cummins. So let's look at the prevalence of PEI. As you can see on the left-hand side, you know, there is strong, solid evidence which are found commonly like pancreatic cancer, um, chronic pancreatitis and cystic fibrosis and other symptoms. But if we look at on the right hand side, you can see emerging evidence of diabetes type one. As you can see, 26% of patients will have PEI and approximately 9% of diabetes is secondary to pancreatic disease. And in type two, 12% will have PEI. So, whoops, sorry. So what are the symptoms? Um, well, PEI causes malabsorption and maldigestion, and this results in steatorrhea, where you have loose, greasy, foul-smelling stu stools, and sometimes very difficult to flush. You can have abdominal pain, diarrhea, and if any patient has diarrhea, PEI should be suspected. Uh, fatigue, which is likely to be the di direct result of malnutrition, and then you'll also have some weight loss. And symptoms also will depend on what the patients eat. So these kind of patients normally reduce the fat intake purely because of the symptoms that they have. So earlier I mentioned the three T's, and this is when you see a patient, and you know what you think, when you see a patient with either one of these symptoms, you should start thinking PEI at this stage. So we've discussed the prevalence and the symptoms of PEI, but what are the consequences of not treating PEI? Well, as we've discussed, PEI leads to maldigestion of fats, proteins, and carbohydrate, and of course, malabsorption of nutrients, which is associated with weight loss and malnutrition will increase the risk of nutritional deficiency, osteopenia, osteoporosis, fractures, scar you know, sarcopenia, mortality, and of course, cardiovascular events. So how common are gastrointestinal, you know, GI symptoms in diabetes? Previous studies have suggested PEI is quite common in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, where direct or indirect function tests have been reported the presence of PEI approximately one half of cases of type one diabetes and third cases of type two diabetes. So a direct function test is um, 16 CCK tests, which are accurate and an indirect test, which is uh, used now in more clinical studies is the fecal elastic test, which is the non-invasive and more practical. However, these studies have been largely historical and they've started since 1940s, involving very small numbers and not necessarily relating them all to GI symptoms. So Professor Cummings, who's a diabetologist uh, from Portsmouth, conducted a study in 2015 
And in this study, he looked at GI symptoms and PEI in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Now, this is the most recent studies and it's implemented in clinical practice. So how this works is that clinicians, um, consultants, you know, would, would approach a pharmaceutical company with a proposal. It'll be like a business proposal to conduct a study. They'd like to, they, they would give in, in that would include the method, the outcome results they're looking for and how they're going to be conducting the study. And Abbott had given uh, them an unconditional grant but Abbott had no control over the study. So when a pharmaceutical company gives healthcare professionals like consultants a grant, that is normally for conducting the audit, employing either nurses, extra nurses to do the audits or further tests or anything that they may need. So, Let's have a look at the findings from this clinical paper. Um, so during his diabetic, in his diabetic clinics, patients were proactively and routinely asked about their GI symptoms, including stomach pain, diarrhea, they were using the Bristol stool chart, steatorrhea, or unexplained weight loss. And if they had any symptoms, a fecal elastic test was offered. So we can see here on the first pie chart, um, 68 patients out of 288, that is 24 patients, a quarter of them, had one or more GI symptoms. And that is almost one in every four patients had a GI symptom. In the second pie chart, you can see fecal elastic test was offered and performed on 68 patients. Now, 25 of those did not provide a sample. Only 43 samples were collected. And out of those samples collected, 25, that's 58% of these patients had normal results. And 18 patients of the remaining group had low fecal elastic of less than 200, which is defined as PEI. Now, if we look at the third chart, 33%, that's six out of 18 patients, were found to have a fecal elastic below 100. And that's showing us that these patients had severe PEI. The graph is telling us that if you routinely and proactively ask your patients if they had GI symptoms, probably find high numbers than expected as demonstrated in this study. So one in four patients had GI symptoms when tested. 42 of these patients with GI symptoms were due to PEI. And if you look at the numbers, one in 10 patients had PEI. So what does this tell us? I mean, this tells us that GI symptoms were common in people with diabetes, that's 24%, one in every four patients. PEI is responsible for 42% of GI symptoms in diabetic patients when fecal elastic test was performed. 25% who had steatorrhea, only six had fecal elastic less than 200. 12 did not report steatorrhea, however, you know, but had PEI. So remember that steatorrhea is a poor marker for diagnose or exclude PEI in diabetes. Now it is useful to ask the question, if they had steatorrhea, that certainly does not mean that they have PEI. And this if they had PI, it doesn't mean that they would have steatorrhea either. So thinking of potential PEI and treating, diagnosing PEI with fecal elastic test is as, you know, it's very important as the study demonstrated. And this is where the second T comes in. So the first one was to think of PEI when pres you know, patients present with symptoms and then routinely and proactively asking these patients if they had any GI symptoms. And this brings us to the second T, which is test. So you must test with fecal elastic as the study has shown us. And then again, how would you diagnose PEI? The British Gastroenterology Guidelines recommend that a non-invasive pancreatic function test, preferably a fecal elastic test, which is one sample, and an easy test. So again, you know, the, just a few guidelines. If the results are 
over 200, then it's normal. If the patient's readings are between 100 to 200, that patient has mild PEI. And if it's less than 100, the patient has severe PEI. So why would you treat uh, pancreatic exocrine insufficiency in, di you know, in diabetic patients? So we've thought about PEI, tested them, and we think you know, on patients who we think might have PEI. Now we've also discussed the consequences of not treating. Now let us discuss why we should treat PEI in diabetes. Now you would normally treat PEI to normalize digestion, absorption of neutral status, to improve their quality of life, you know, by giving them PERT. Small studies have shown that PERT may improve glycemic control as normal nutrient digestion and absorption will improve metabolic instability. And this is where your 30 comes in. So you've thought about PEI, you've tested for PEI, now you really need to treat PEI. Now, there are some consequences guidelines, so we'll just look at one uh, very briefly. Again, you know, routine diabetic re at reviews, GI symptoms are present, rule out the differential diagnosis and test for PEI. Trials of treatment in clinical, you know, history and test results suggest PEI, there is no suggestion of a secondary cause other than diabetes. So you should immediately start PERT like prion, uh, review treatments after four to six weeks. I mean, if symptoms are not controlled, consider increasing the dose of PERT. If symptoms fail to respond to PERT after titration, you must refer these patients to a specialist. The guideline also highlights the importance of three T's we've talked about today. That's think, test, and treat. And again, in summary, the GI symptoms are common with people in diabetes. Symptoms could be due to medication or PEI. You know, PEI is associated with weight loss, maldigestion, and malabsorption, causing possible malnutrition and may impact metabolic instability. If PEI is suspected, fecal elastic tests should be performed. And pancreatic enzyme with, you know, replacement therapy like PERT should be improved to improve the patient's quality of life symptoms. Now, did you know, I mean, I don't know if you're aware that more than 90% of your normal pancreatic function is lost. So this is why steatorrhea, you know, when a patient comes into you with steatorrhea, this is a late stage symptom occurs when 90% of the normal pancreatic function is lost. So making diagnosis as early as possible is very important. So how should you treat uh, PEI? Again, as mentioned, early detec you know, detection is important and PERT should be initiated as soon as possible. So every patient with PEI and fat maldigestion, regardless of the presence or degree of steatorrhea and associated symptoms should be treated with PERT. Small studies have shown PERT may improve glycemic control. Now, Creon, you know, there are a few reasons why Creon is successful. One is because Creon has a unique technology. It's recommended by national guidelines. It's widely prescribed in UK. And Creon is indicated for treatment of PEI in adults, children, and infants. And it's available in three strengths, Creon Micro, 10,000 and 25,000 units. Now, I know this sounds quite like a, a, a huge amount of doses, but I if, if we think about a healthy pancreas, you know, a pancreas, a healthy pancreas produces around 720,000 lipase units every time we eat a meal. So that's around three to 600 calories. It could be a sandwich or something, and 10% is required to maintain a normal digestion. So if we think about a patient who has PEI, they're not able to produce 720,000 and will require PERT. So it's, remote, it's, you know, it's, re, it's important to remember, PERT should be taken with food every time a patient eats to maintain normal digestion. So what is the um, 
effective dosing for creon. So to minimize, you know, efficacy and uh, success of treatment. So the minimum recommended dose for an adult, it's 550,000 lipase units for a main meal and 25,000 for every snack. Now, again, it's important to remind patients that they should be taking Creon with food, because if they don't eat, there's no point taking Creon. So to achieve the best therapeutic response, Creon, again, you know, should be able to mimic the digestive response to a normal healthy pancreas. So when a Creon capsule is taken with food or snack, they make their way into the stomach and release its unique mini microspheres. Now these microspheres are covered in acid resistant and tarry coated that protect the enzymes as they move from the stomach into the duodenum. And when in the duodenum, the entire contact of the mini microspheres dissolves and the enzymes are released to break down the protein fats and carbohydrates from the meal in nutrients which is absorbed. Now it's important again to remember that, you know, creon should be taken food. So, uh, you know, Hi, it's Anobia. I'm Hi. really sorry to interrupt you, but I uh, just want to let you know that we have maybe five more minutes. For I'm finished. I'm finished. I was just going to say well, thank you so much for allowing thank you. me to no, present no. today. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Okay. Um, so we have a few questions for Mr. Khalil as well. Once you're done, we can go ahead with that. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, that was a wonderful session, Zenobia. Thank you so much for your session. Um, Mr. Khalil, are you still here with us? If you could please unmute yourself. Uh, we have a few questions yep. um, regarding um, your session. Yep. Um, I'll just give you the questions. Um, so there are a few questions with the same team. So I'm just going to combine those questions and ask you. Uh, there were a few people who asked about how to determine the p-value as yeah. to what, what is there a particular criteria that you must use? Um, yeah. Or how do you decide which study is going to get which p-value? Okay. So let's keep this simple. Uh, 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 what have I just done? I wanted that. Maybe I didn't explain it better. Can you see my screen? Um, Anjali, if you could let him share his screen. Yeah, it's there. Uh, it's here, right. Okay, so this is what happens, guys. Uh, maybe I didn't explain what p-value means. You have uh, this company that delivers pizza, okay? Right, and they deliver a pizza at, within 30 minutes, their logo is that we can deliver you pizza in, in 35 minutes. And guess what? If you look at a thousand of the deliveries, where would you expect the majority to be? You would expect the majority, if they're right, to be within two standard deviations. Yeah. Then 95% of the time, they say they deliver pizza within 30 minutes and they will be correct because that is what their delivery is. Okay. That's the standard deviation. Unfortunately, that is not real, real life. So occasionally, the, 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 the delivery will be late. Okay? So that exceeds the standard deviation. Now imagine if you're going to now do an analysis. Okay? You're going to do a, a study to look at the delivery times. You're going to take a sample. Now that sample is not the total number. The sample itself will have a normal distribution. Yes, your sample will be a fixed number and you will do a statistical analysis and you will get this. What you want to find out in your sample is how many times in your sample did, did they get out of 40 minutes. So once you have done your sampling and you've got your, you now want to, you want to, inf, you want to use that sampling to give some rough idea of what reality is. So you would say, right, in my sampling, I should expect, right, say that they get it right 95% of the time. So our p-value, before we start, uh, uh, our model of testing this hypothesis is that 95% 
of the time, our sample should also have data within what they have said, right? And the p-value gives us a, a, a figure. That figure means how accurate or how reliable or how unique is our sampling. If that starts to go outside the two standard deviation, then we will say, right, hang on, our sampling does not add up to what they are saying. Capish? So the p-value has to do with the sampling model. Now, in our sampling model, we can say, no, we're not interested in 5%. We're actually interested in 99%. Okay? So they say 40 minutes, 99% of 40 minutes is 30 something, 35 minutes. And therefore, let us now see how many times in our sampling do we get 35, uh, you know, whatever that 95% is. And if it starts to be a, a number that you will say, oh, okay, this is a high number. So that's why p-value has, it, it's, it's, it's not a fixed value. It is what the information from your sampling, whether it's enough to surprise you or not. Okay? That is the point of p-value. P-value should is an astonishing number. The word statistical significance should not appear. It should be a surprising number, surprising value. If from my sampling, I've got a result. Does this explain the hypothesis? No, this is surprising. Uh -uh, I need to do more tests. Or actually, I'm not surprised. This is what they said, and therefore this is right. So that's the point. The problem comes when you have this information, right? So you have studies going on differently. And that, this is the point why we need this language. We need p-values. We need some method of making sense of data that happens like this. Does that help? Yes, I think that was perfect. And I think we just have two more minutes for the session to automatically end. So <laughs> I think we should just um, say our goodbyes and end the session. This was amazing. Thank you so much, Mr. Khalil. And no thank problem. you so much, Zenobia. This was an amazing session. And we had almost 190 people watching. Right. So thank you to all of you. We're going to send you all your feedback forms. Please send us your feedback forms uh, and then we will issue your certificates. If you have any further questions, we're happy to answer them. You could send them via email and we will try to get back to you um, as soon as we can. All right. So that's it from us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.